pray. Our oh, Father and our God, we thank you again for this uh, privilege we have. O oh, come, let us adore him. Yes, this one who was born as a babe, this one who came to save mankind. He died on the cross and he redeemed us back to God. Father, we thank you for him. And again, as we come this morning to praise him, to give him thanks for what he has done for us, we thank you. Father, we just ask that each one here this morning might get a blessing. And we pray if uh, there's one here not knowing you as Savior, that today they might come to know you as their Savior. Father, we thank you for Phil, and we thank you for the preparation he has made. And as he come to present the word, Father, just uh, bless the word, encourage our hearts, and cause again as we listen, we might even get something afresh to take home today. Father, we thank you for the families here, and we think of this time of the year where families, friends gather, we pray, for God, that you might just uh, encourage their hearts to the real meaning of Christmas. And Father, that they too might even come closer to knowing you as Savior. Bless our every hearts here this morning and cause again, Father, as we listen to the word, our hearts might be blessed and we might give you the victory. We praise we praise you, we adore you, we love you, Father, and we give all these things in our Savior's worthy and precious name. Amen. as the kids are getting set up, this was actually a song that we sang, Maggie and I sang six years ago, uh, the day that we brought Dexter home from the hospital. So, uh, but entitled Servant and King, the lyrics are up there for you, but even this morning we thought of Christ as our King. And even just to really connect and tie the birth of Christ with the reason that he came, that he might give his life a ransom for many, but now he is risen and rules on high. So, uh, Please feel free to jump in if you learn it, even the chorus as we sing it a few times. And uh, you're allowed to sit down. We'll give you guys a break. So.
kids to come on up to sing a song.
And we will uh, invite all the kids to sit with their parents uh, as we look forward to Phil's message, a few more uh, musical numbers. I will be up in the nursery. If any of the little ones get out of hand, feel free to bring them up to me. So uh, enjoy the rest of this morning. Thanks, Joe. This is a song written by Ellie Holcomb. Uh, we encourage you to sing along with the chorus. Uh, but this series that we've been doing, uh, The Gifts for a King, we looked at gold, frankincense, and Phil is going to take a look at myrrh this morning. But this song in particular, the first verse really focuses on Christ's birth. The second verse looks at his death. But the chorus really is, what impact does that have for us today? So please, you'll catch along easily. Uh, it's, a, it's a very easy chorus, so please sing along for the chorus as we sing this song together. for giving us this opportunity to say this prayer. 
This Christmas, Lord, come to the manger of my heart. Fill me with your presence from the very start. As I prepare for this holy day and gifts to be given, remind me of all you gave, sending your son from heaven. The, the first Christmas gift, the greatest gift ever. You come as a baby born in a manger, wrapped like the gifts I find under my tree, waiting to be opened to reveal your love for me. Restore to me the wonder that came with Jesus' birth when he left heaven's riches and wrapped himself in rags on earth. Emmanuel, God with us, your presence came that night, and angels announced into the darkness, God brings his light. Do not be afraid, they said to the shepherds in the field. Speak to my heart today, Lord, and help me to yield. Make me like those shepherd boys, obedient to your call, <laughs> setting all distractions and worries aside. To you, I give them all. Surround me with your presence, Lord. I long to hear your voice. Clear my mind of weighty concerns and all the holiday noise. Slow me down this Christmas. Let me not be in a rush. In the midst of all the people and planning, I want to feel your hush. This Christmas, Jesus, come to the manger of my heart. Invade my soul like Bethlehem, bringing peace to every part. Dwell within me and around me as I unwrap your presence each day. Keep me close to you, Lord. It's in your wonderful name I pray. Thank you. I'm going to be reading from Matthew 1, 2, 1 to 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Ju Judah, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jew Jews? For we have saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it was written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Ju Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from, for from among you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And Herod summoned the wise men secretly and asserted from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent to them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search, diligent for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came over to came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And then going into the house, they saw the child with, with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures. They offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Let us stand again and sing to our king. In number 600, 604, 604, we three kings of Orient are, bearing gifts we traverse afar, field and fountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star. Born a king on Bethlehem's plain, gold I bring to crown them again. King forever, cease and never, over us all to reign. Glorious now, behold them arise, king and God in sacrifice. Alleluia, alleluia, sounds through the earth and sky. Let us sound now here with our mouths and with our lips. We three kings.
to Phil, and he's going to share with us the third gift that the wise men present to the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas. It's wonderful to see you here this morning. Thank you for, for coming. And my uh, profound thanks to all who have participated uh, in our time together here this morning. Our modified Christmas Eve uh, service. It's just a wonderful time to uh, remember the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have been looking at gifts for a king. And it's one of those uh, stories that we seem to know pretty well, or do we? We brought gold and frankincense for you, Jesus, but wait, there's myrrh. <laughs> well, that's just a little plain on words. We know the story well, or do we? And then, of course, uh, had the wise men had their GPS, head east, keep going east, go east, some more recalculating. Balthazar, put that thing away. Let's just follow the star. And we know the story well. Just follow the star. In fact, we've just sung We Three Kings. And the truth of the matter is, they probably weren't kings. But we remember the story that wise men traveled from the Orient to greet the baby Jesus in the manger. They brought gifts, and they brought these gifts and bestowed them upon the newborn king. The song that we've just sang even assigned names to them, Gaspar, Balthasar, and Melchior. And many nativity scenes would include uh, camels and other animals. But really, the scriptures are the ones, uh, that's where we go to for our source of information. We only really know what the scriptures record for us. The scriptures record for us that they brought gifts. That's what we've been looking at. But the fact is they probably were not kings. They were actually king makers. Uh, in fact, uh, they were astrologers uh, or magicians. That's where we get the word magic from. Uh, the word uh, magi. So perhaps it would be better termed that it's we three magi, not we three kings. But they were wise. They apparently had wealth. And uh, they were ones that were keen to train kings. And I would say that uh, uh, as they followed that star in the east, they had a lengthy journey. The scriptures would indicate to us that perhaps they had uh, a very lengthy journey from Babylon to Jerusalem, perhaps 900 miles, maybe, maybe a little bit more. And it may have taken as many as 120 days to make that journey. And it was likely, very likely, that they did not arrive the night Jesus was born. In fact, it probably was months later. When Jesus was a toddler, in fact, we get a little hint at this from scripture 
that says that the wise men ultimately ended up in a home, not, not the inn. And over these last uh, couple of Sundays, we've been taking a much closer look at uh, the presents that were gifted to the Lord Jesus Christ. The first gift that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, as uh, our brother Paul took us through it, it was the gift of gold. Reminding us of the kingship of Jesus. But the Magi's gifts were not simply a demonstration of wealth, as wealthy as they probably were, but they really conveyed a much deeper meaning. The gold represents Jesus' kingship. We were thinking and meditating upon that this morning as we remember the Lord Jesus Christ. But we read in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, these words. As the visions during the night continued, I saw coming with clouds of heaven, one like a son of man. And when he reached the ancient of days and was presented before him, he received dominion, splendor, and kingship of all nations. Peoples and tongues will serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away. His kingship, one that shall not be destroyed. And isn't it true? Jesus' kingship transcends all earthly rulers. And the Magi's recognized that. And they came and worshiped the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, frankincense was another gift explored. And it reminds us, as Joe very eloquently did, reminds us of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Frankincense represents deity. In the Old Testament, frankincense was traditionally burned in the temple as an offering to God. We read about that in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 2. And by bringing this gift, the Magi once again affirmed that Jesus was no ordinary man. No, he was both fully man and fully God. Colossians chapter two, verses nine and 10 say this, for in him dwells the fullness of the deity bodily, and you share in this fullness in him, who is the head of every principality and power. But today, we're taking a little closer look at yet the third gift, myrrh. And perhaps this gift was the strangest, most curious, maybe even insulting of all gifts. So we ask ourselves, what is myrrh? Well, myrrh is uh, a tree that is grown uh, but the, the product of the tree is an aromatic resin from a reddish gum uh, tree from a low-growing th thorny tree. And I want you to bear in mind that this tree is a, a tree that has thorns. And uh, it grows in some of the most arid regions of Africa and the Middle East, characteristic of hot and dry regions. The myrrh tree, when it's uh, in bloom, uh, takes on a characteristic like this, but I want you to notice, although the, the, the distant picture doesn't picture for us the thorns, but look at those thorns. Those are, not, those are pretty, uh, pretty intense looking thorns. And so what happens uh, when they uh, harvest such a thing, uh, carefully they would take a sharp instrument and just score the bark or the covering of the tree stalk and with it, it would wound the tree, much like the uh, latex that emerges from a rubber tree. And then that uh, sap is uh, uh, stimulated to produce as a way to cover over the wound, uh, and the product hardens on the tree, and then they collect it, and it takes on that, uh, 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 well, it takes on a, a characteristic like this. It looks like little nuggets of of, uh, of a dried sap. And those resin drops are collected and they're sorted uh, after they're dried 
We see in scripture that myrrh is mentioned 17 times, 14 times in the Old Testament, three times in the New Testament. So we say, well, what, what is it used for? And why would this gift be given? Well, in Esther, we read about Esther undergoing nearly a year's worth of beauty treatments, such, uh, some of which was the use of myrrh, it was also used as a perfume also used as an analgesic or a painkiller. And in some parts of the world today, especially China and Egypt, myrrh is still used as a painkiller. Mark records for us in Mark chapter 15, we spent some time this morning in Mark 15, but in Mark 15, verse 23, the Lord Jesus Christ was offered a mixture of wine and myrrh to help kill the pain that he was experiencing, but he refused because our Lord wanted to experience every ounce of pain. It's also used as an embalming fluid. Egyptians used it to embalm the inside of a body, where Jews used it to embalm the outside of the body. We read in John chapter 19, verse 39, that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, after claiming the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, took upwards of 75 pounds of spices, some of which were myrrh to wrap the body of Jesus. So we've been reminded of gifts. We've been reminded of the gift of gold, that of his kingship. We've been reminded of the gift of frankincense, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning we're looking at the gift of myrrh, which reminds for us, reminds us this morning, the death of Jesus Christ. This was a gift that actually predicted the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it does beg the question, what on earth did Mary and Joseph ever think when presented with such a, a, such a gift? I mean, myrrh was principally used to, to treat the dead. Imagine giving a gift to a child that symbolized death. Myrrh, when it's uh, fully utilized well, uh, gives its best odor its best scent when it's crushed and it reminds us that the lord jesus christ in isaiah was crushed for our iniquities it's also a reminder that this child jesus would save people from their sin by going to a place of myrrh where myrrh was used the most and of course that was the place of death in terms of its symbolic significance in Jesus' ministry, it's very interesting to come to grips with the fact that this child, the Lord Jesus Christ, was the only person ever born with the distinct purpose of death. And scripture reminds us that death on the cross was not a plan B. No, God planned it this way long before the beginning, before the foundations of the world. There's a, a striking painting, and I'm not much of an art enthusiast, but I was drawn to this picture of William Holman Hunt, and it's a painting that's simply called The Shadow of Death. And it, this, this artist interpreted as best he knew the story, of the Lord Jesus Christ working in his father's shop, a carpenter shop. And perhaps after a long day of, of working, uh, the Lord uh, here is depicted in this painting, was just kind of, just kind of stretching himself out. But, but look at the shadow. Take a look at that shadow. That shadow. Take a look too at his mother whose face is not shown but it appears that she's looking in a box and oh look, look in that box. Well, there's some gold and there's some frankincense, probably some myrrh as well. But then she turns her head and takes a glance at that shadow depicted on the wall. The shadow cast on a wall, the shadow of her son. It almost takes on the characteristic of a future crucifixion. And you can't help but notice the star-shaped opening 
reminding us of the star that guided the Magi to the newborn son of God. The wood shavings on the floor and the carpentry tools perhaps foreshadow the instruments of his death. Nails, the wooden cross, and don't neglect that bright red headdress reminding us of the crown of thorns. Well, it does beg the question, we looked at it the other night at our midweek meeting, just how much did Mary know about the future of her child? Well, she was given a first hint in Matthew 121, when the angel mentioned to Joseph that his wife, she would bear a son and shall call his name Jesus, or he will save his people from their sins. She might have had a second hint as well from Luke uh, chapter 2, verse 34. When the child was taken to the temple and the dedication was given, and Simeon blessed them and said to his Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. So that thoughts from every heart may be revealed. And maybe she had even a third hint, given as this gift of myrrh. You know, a parent does not think of death when a child is born. Take a look at this uh, prayer that was written by Max Lucado, simply called Mary's Prayer. Rest well, tiny hands, for though you belong to a king, you will touch no satin, own no gold, you will grasp no pen, guide no brush. No, your tiny hands are reserved for the works more precious, to touch a leper's open wound, to wipe a widow's weary tear, to claw the ground of Gethsemane. Your hands, so tiny, so white, clutch tonight in an infant's fist. They aren't destined to hold a scepter, nor wave from a place, uh, sorry, nor wave from a palace balcony. They are reserved instead for a Roman spike that will staple them to a Roman cross. What kind of father would give his only son to be killed. And we come to recognize, perhaps in ways never before realized, that only a father who loves you enough to redeem you with the only way possible, that being the death of his son. And so we come to what's our response? We've all been familiar with this little quip, wise men still seek him. But really, what is our response as we approach the reality of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ? Keeping in mind that the Magi saw the star, their response was they rejoiced. And they saw the child and they worshiped. You know, they saw the star and rejoiced because they found what they came looking for. They saw the child and worshiped because they found what they were looking for. And when they found that, they worshiped. It's a strong word. It's usually to, uh, used to describe the worship of God. And here we have these influential kingmakers, wise men bowing down because they knew that was their place. And it mirrors for us our response that we're to rejoice and worship. Keep in mind that worship is pretty costly. For these magi, it was a long trip. They brought expensive gifts, but notice that giving and worship are things that go hand in hand. But also bear in mind that joy and worship are choices that you and I have the ability to make. And let's not fall into the trap of busyness and tradition that may impact our focus at this time of year. Let us savor the gifts of Christmas. 
gold, reminding us that indeed he is a king. Frankincense, that he is both man and God. And myrrh, that he was born for the purpose of dying. We sing the song, Hail the Heavenly Prince of Peace, Hail the Son of Righteousness, Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Had wonderful reminders this morning of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've been reminded that he has a name, that he has a face, that he indeed is God come down, Emmanuel, dwelling with us. And today we celebrate that day. I'm going to ask Paul to come and lead us in our traditional candlelight service as we close out our time together here this morning. Paul. Now we're going to transition into the candlelight singing. So if each one of you can grab a candle, that there should be some on the, the pews. If not, check the pews in front or in the back of you. Um, before we start singing to the light of the world who gave his life and, and died for the sins of the world, I just want to do a little demonstration just so that we, we glorify the Lord in safety. And so I believe Jim has, Jim has a lighter and he's, he's going to light the first candle. Um, just, just to keep in mind, <clears throat> The unlighted candle, you're going to dip the wick of the unlighted candle into the, the wick of the lighted candle. Never dip the lighted candle into the wick of an unlighted candle. You always dip the unlighted candle wick into the lighted candle, okay? So I just remember, never take the lighted candle and dip into the unlighted. It's always the unlit candle, and you dip it into the candle that's lit, all right? So... So as we as we start, if we can gather in a circle, um, we'll do a semicircle. Sure, you might notice we don't have papers. All the words are going to be up on the screen. Uh, but let's go here, kind of a U-shaped circle. We're going to kind of be shoulder to shoulder, but close enough where we can light. And we'll get the candle going from both directions, from this side and this side. And as it's lighting, uh, Paul will lead us in the sink. start singing um, saints here we go we, we light a thousand candles bright around the earth today and all the beams will shine across the heavens grand display yes Oh, that's you. 
Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day where we can gather together in fellowship and to worship you for who you are and for what you've done for us by providing your Son the perfect gift, the one who gave of himself the perfect sacrifice, for you made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We thank you, Lord, for the greatest gift. We thank you. For your son Jesus Christ who laid down his life for us. Lord as we get ready to disperse and to go to our separate homes and to gather together in fellowship with friends and family help us not to lose sight of the reason for the season the true reason which is your son Jesus Christ who was born to die who came with a mission in mind to lay down his life for us. He loved us while we were still sinners. While we were still enemies of God, he died for us so that we could join back in fellowship with him. We thank you, Lord, for this. We thank you for this time where we gather together here today. We thank you for the message that was given. Uh, we ask that we wouldn't be hearers of your word only, but doers of your word as well, applying it to our lives. Help us to be the salt and light of the earth, Lord, to let our light shine that men can see our good deeds and glorify you because of it. We ask now that we would have each and every one of us will have a Merry Christmas with our friends and family and that we wouldn't lose sight of the true meaning of Christmas. And we ask these things in your son, Jesus Christ, holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. You, you can blow out your, your candles. <laughs> Please be careful, even once you blow your candle out, the wax is still 